this season uh, to meet with them and speak to them with truth, season with love and with grace. Lord, we pray for those who are ill today in our fellowship, for Lois, uh, recovering, Lord God, for those recovering from surgery, for those who are needing, Lord, your grace and mercy, for Gerthart, Lord, to uh, be raised up, Lord God. And these are your servants, Lord, so they stand and fall according to you. So if you want them to be resting today, Lord, you rest them. If you want them to be up, you have all the power and capabilities to raise them up. So, Lord, thank you. And we ask you for your word today, that it will penetrate our hearts and minds to reveal your glory and to reveal Jesus through these pages. In his name we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 5. And I'm starting to miss Galatians already because I know that it's going to come to an end very, very soon. Uh, But we're going to enjoy every moment of it as we are in chapter 5. And in chapter 5... Paul is going to address the final, this is the final part about being under the law of Moses or the gospel of Jesus. And so the title of our message today, very simply put, Real Freedom, Real Freedom, Hang On to Jesus and the Cross. That's real freedom. And Paul is going to address that. What is real freedom? And we've been talking about the gospel And what Galatians, the the letter to the Galatians, was addressed to a people, a church, uh, actually a group of churches in southern Galatians who were believers, who were Gentiles, who were not Jews. They were believers in Jesus. They have come to know uh, the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ by the gospel. Paul preached the gospel to them. And now there were a group of people. These were the Judaizers coming from the area of Jerusalem. Uh, These were uh, defined as uh, basically people that believed in Jesus, but also had added the law of Moses to their faith and walk. And therefore, they went everywhere Paul went, causing a stir, causing division, causing very much the things that we have addressed and dealt with even in our own fellowship, is those who mingle among them and begin to put laws and regulations and things of that nature to Christians to move away from faith and trust in Jesus only to the reality that you must keep, you must do, you must obey a series of regulations and list of things that uh, need to be addressed in order to become more righteous, in order to become in better standing with God. So basically, the Judaizers were preaching that, yes, it's okay to believe in Jesus and to trust in Jesus, but to that you need to add adherence to law, adherence to regulations, and that regulation was called the Law of Moses. And the Law of Moses is found in the Old Testament, in the five books of Moses, specifically 613 laws contained in those five books. That is what they call the Law of Moses, adherence to those laws. We know them. Uh, We don't know all 613, but we know 10 of them. The Ten Commandments are part of that. So the Ten Commandments, you know them well, plus 603, 603 others. Uh, that's what the law of Moses. And they were saying, great, you found Jesus, but now you need to be better than the rest, and you need to adhere to the law of Moses and the regulations and the requirements of the law. And they're saying, you can't be a real Christian unless you're really working it, and then you're really, really fighting for that true faith in Jesus and, of course, the regulation of Moses. And Paul goes on to explain to them that this is not the case at all. In fact, we find that in the first four chapters, that Paul makes the case, you can't have law, can't follow law, and you can't have grace at the same time. Because if you were to follow the law, you need to follow the whole entire gambit of the law. The package deal, 613, you're not free to pick and choose which ones you like and which ones you don't like, and you have to take Moses as a whole package, 613 laws, which, by the way, if you were to read them all, there are some that I think you can keep today. Don't eat spiders. You guys good with that? You are obeying the law of Moses, right? Amen to that. Um, don't eat a bat. How about don't eat a bat? Are you very good, good with that? You are, can I see the law? Look at that, 613, that's 611. Keep them coming, Pastor. We're doing good. Don't wear clothing of mixed materials. Oh, brother. 
If I could look at my shirt tag, I can find out. It was probably cotton mixed with polyester, or if you lived in the 70s, you only wear polyester. And, and you said, well, that's it. I broke the law of Moses. How many guys drove, drove a car yesterday? Oh, shame on you. The law of Moses would have condemned you. How many of you guys cooked yesterday? Oh, that's it. Pastor, 611, 609. Have you ever had wood rot in your house? Did you tear it down? The whole house. Did you tear it down and build a new one? Oh, you know, the law of Moses said if you that, if you'd get that, if you have any wood rot in your house, you're to tear it down and build another one out of love for your brethren. So shame on you. You guys did not keep the law of Moses. And those were only a few. There's 608 others that you have to keep. And it's like a link. And it's like a chain link. If you break one, you break them all. You can't just pick one or two. You broke them all because it's a package deal. So people would say, well, we're only going to follow the certain ones that we like, like Sabbath, like kosher laws, like eating laws, dietary laws. And therefore, as Paul will explain, if you take on the law of Moses and you only do a portion of it, you think you're complying with the law of Moses, but actually the Bible says you're a lawbreaker. You are a lawbreaker because you did not keep the whole law. You only picked and choose what you wanted. See how, it's, how terrible it is to be under a yoke, as Paul will call it, a yoke of slavery, the regulations. Now, the law, something wrong with the law. It's good. It's pure. It's righteous. It's the standard that God requires. But do not attempt to, to have any righteousness out of the law and do not attempt to be saved by keeping its requirements. That would negate the gospel. That would negate what Jesus came to do, and that is to deliver us from sin, self, and the power of the requirement of the law. So as Christians, especially Gentile Christians, we're not under an obligation to keep the law of Moses, although that has become very popular in our world, in our age, in which even Christians, even churches, have gone into error by going into trying to abide by the law of Moses. And so they meet on Saturday and not on Sunday because you're not to do that, and they don't eat certain food, and they don't dress a certain way, and on and on and on it goes. Of course, there's only a few that they like to keep. Uh, they wouldn't really deal with the other 603. Um, however, obviously pick and choosing. Freedom. Freedom. The world wants freedom. In fact, if you have any kind of political affiliation, which I don't necessarily, uh, but if you have any kind of political affiliation, you'll hear this all the time, especially in a political charge environment in which we live. Freedom! Freedom of speech. Freedom of politics. Freedom to share what we want to share. I guess we have freedom from politics. Maybe that would be better. But freedom. Freedom from poverty. Freedom from hunger, freedom from, um, I guess, politicians. We should have another one. But freedom, and on and on, people want freedom. And even if they get those freedoms, guess what? They still demand more because what man really requires, or really desires, I should say, and if you talk to the average person, what is the real freedom that you want? And the real freedom that they want, if they were honest, is freedom from God. They don't want God telling them what to do. And they say, that's real freedom. If we just get to do what we want, isn't that the American way? Just let us do whatever we want. And we call that freedom. The Bible doesn't call that freedom. The Bible calls it the worst form of slavery you can have. Freedom, it's not freedom. It's slavery. Slavery to self, that you are bound by your own appetites to do what you want to do, and sometimes very destructive things. But the Bible says that real freedom is the one that is the hardest to attain on your own because you can't attain it on your own. The real freedom, real freedom has to be given. Real freedom has to be given. And therefore, here comes the clash of ideas. If freedom has to be given and I can't do anything to earn it, then I don't want it. Because I feel like I need to really elevate my own self and my own ethics and work ethics in order to receive it. And so the ones who claim to be the most free are actually the ones that are most in bondage because they are free. They're not free 
uh, to relieve themselves from self. But Jesus gives us freedom. And this is what the Bible speaks of. If we just go to verse 1 very quickly. Chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. God gave us his word, and majority of the New Testament is in the form of letters, epistles. Epistles means letters, letters to one another, letters to churches. This is one of those letters, Paul writing to the Galatian churches, a letter, a personal letter. And when we read the letter, we have to really understand that it's a verse, one verse does not stand on itself. The verse that you read, it's part of other verses, we call that context, and part of the whole entire Bible, that it's the Word of God. So one verse needs to be understood in light of the other verses around it, in light of the book that you're reading, in light of the testament that you're reading, and in light of the whole Bible that you're reading. And so when people become confused is when they read one verse, and they say, huh, I know the Bible, I know one verse, and they go on, and they make up their own ideas about the Bible, and their own ideas about theology, without ever reading all the other verses before this one and all the other verses after that. But pastor, are you saying that we have to read the whole Bible? Yeah. Are you saying we have to study the Bible? I mean, that, that, takes, that can take on a time, you know, kind of a lifetime. Yes, you understand now what it means to follow God. To follow the Bible. It means that you are to know the full revelation of God from Genesis to Revelations, to read it, to study it, and to take on to it. And after years of reading it, you come to know one thing for sure. The things you thought you knew, you were wrong. That's hard to say, isn't it? Because if we have a lot of pride, that could be against us. But you also discover some things you never knew. Isn't that amazing when you find something you didn't know and you just, ah, oh, it's like walking in heaven. Praise the Lord. And then you find things that you were wrong, and God corrected you on it. Ooh, we don't like that one. But praise God for all of them. And as you read more and study more, you'll find yourself in those situations. You'll know more things that you didn't know before. You'll be corrected on things you knew, you thought you knew. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from bondage. Free from bad teaching. Free from things that are never in the Bible, and yet we believed it for some reason or another. Maybe we heard it from someone. But this is the freedom that Christ has set us free from. Jesus has set us free, and he set us free from sin. He set us free from the law. He set us free from all that it's related to the requirements of the law. And this is what Christians are to be most incredibly blessed and assured, the fact that today... Jesus Christ does not judge you on the basis of the law of Moses. Jesus Christ stands with you on the basis of faith and trust in him as the only requirement for eternal life, but a relationship with him. And Paul is going to use strong language. Strong language like yoke. There's a little yoke of slavery. What is that yoke of slavery he's talking about? That yoke of slavery has to do with the law. He compares having a yoke like an animal uh, it's got about to plow, plow the field, and he puts a yoke, and that is the yoke of slavery. He actually calls it the yoke of slavery. And Jesus actually sets us free. It's the, it's the contrast. In verse 1, freedom, yoke of slavery. Which one do you want? Well, freedom from sin, guilt, punishment, fear, the power of sin over our lives, and the, what the requirements of the law were. All those things Jesus sets us free. And so Jesus is, brings real freedom, and he gives you real freedom. But here's one thing also that's interesting. He means to keep, that you need to keep that freedom. Not only did he give you that freedom, but you are to keep it. You are to maintain that freedom. You see what I'm saying? It's not just having freedom. Part one, maintain that freedom. And that's what Jesus meant for us to have. Freedom, but to maintain it. How do we maintain it? and not be concerned and not be brought into the yoke of slavery the galatians were struggling with this because they were being brought back by the persuasion of these men and you're going to find out later on paul addresses one of them at least one of them calls him a he so we know it was a guy uh, that was disturbing them 
and bringing them back into the yoke of slavery of those 613 commandments. And therefore, Jesus was not of any use to the Galatians. Because if you have the law, why do you need Jesus? That's the point. If you're trying to get there on your own, why have any of Christ? Because, by the way, Christ wants none of that. If you're going to mix in requirements and regulations and, and keep, try to keep some kind of formula, you can't have Jesus in that at the same time. And so he goes on to explain that Jesus is to give us that freedom, stand firm in it, he says, and don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So Christians can lose that freedom, is what Paul is explaining. Can, use, can lose that freedom through trying to become righteous through requirements. Look at verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, if you receive circumcision, Christ will be no, of no benefit to you. Christ will be no benefit to you. Isn't that one of the hardest things to realize? That if you want to go back, and there's quite a few Christians that want to go back under the law, they want to, they have this whole movement, Hebrew Roots Movement, several other movements. That's the basic name of it. Uh, they want to go back under the law. Then basically, Paul says, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You want the law? You want to go back under the slavery? You want to go back under the regulations of law and, and ordinance to keep? If you accept it, then you will lose freedom in Jesus. If you accept this yoke again, if you say, well, maybe I will be more righteous if I keep the Sabbath. Maybe I'll start this week. And you go back under that and, and think that this is will ingratiate yourself more with God. Then we're in the process of losing the freedom that we have in Jesus. Now, if, uh, by the way, the Bible makes it very clear. If you want to keep the Sabbath, go ahead. If you don't want to, don't. It's, 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 it's neither profit you one way or the other. You want to keep it? Good. You want to want to keep it? Good. It really brings no real righteousness to you at all whatsoever if you're going to keep a day. What righteousness is, is through faith in Jesus. So we're not obliged to do it. It's not a requirement to do it. And it's not a requirement not to do it. That's the freedom in Christ. Now, um, granted, we're not to go on it for things that we... You know, if, we, if we think Jesus is not enough and we're trying to become more godly through these things, you don't become godly by following regulations. You become godly by spending more time with Jesus and in prayer and in his word. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. That's becoming more godly. Well, let's continue. If you accept this, Paul says, you will go back under the law and Christ will be no benefit to you. You must do this. You must do that, they said. And so Christ has set us free, and therefore these Galatians were going back under the law, which is a really, you know, who would want to do that? But I met Christians. I met Christians that want to go back under the law, the desire to have this regulation over their lives. I don't understand it, except for the fact that I think they don't think Jesus is enough. Somehow they've been convinced that it's not enough to believe or to trust in him. So... Uh, by the way, Jesus, uh, setting us free from it, sets us free in things that maybe we never thought about. Uh, sets us free from sin and the power of sin, and now sets us on a road, on a journey, on a walk with him that is the walk of the Spirit. Right? Having that, knowing that, many Christians today, I believe, that I've met and talked to, having been set free, in many cases, they know the truth, they would agree with the facts, but they really haven't set free, and they have developed a certain framework of, of what they can and cannot do in their own Christian walk, and certain freedoms that they don't think they have, and they've become sort of um, isolated, and, and they become sort of a regulation unto themselves, and many times they don't, many times, bad relationships with other Christians, they have a guilt, they have a guilt complex in their lives, and to realize all this is to say, I don't think, I think Christians believe, in a sense, agree with the facts of the scriptures and the Bible and the gospel. I think they agree with it, 
but they have not been able to appropriate it in their lives and really live out the freedom that you have in Jesus. You know, think about issues of, you know, this, this, of course, this month, this whole season, it's relationships with families and things of that nature, and people go to family meetings with this guilt and this remorse and this shame and this, and, and then there's issues with other family members. This is not a whole talk on that. We can go a whole hour on just that bitterness and contention with family, and they can't let it go. They can't let it go. And these are Christians. These are not like atheists or anything. These are Christians who are still tied to things that happened in the past. And they haven't even been, they don't know if you know, they haven't forgiven someone or they don't know if they've been forgiven. So they have this guilt in their lives and they cannot walk truly in the freedom of Christ because they're still bound to what happened in the past, to what happened a few months ago or a year ago or 10 years ago. And it's to say that a lot of Christians know the gospel. I'll give you a booklet. You check out the boxes. Yep, I believe this, I believe that but truly have not appropriated in their lives daily to set them free from anything that has happened in your relationships. Any guilt, any bitterness, any anger, any frustration, any unforgiveness, they still hold on to it like if it's meant to be hold on to. And Christ has said, I set you free from that. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what they did to you. It doesn't matter what you did to them either. It's been forgiven. It needs to be dealt with, of course, if, there, if there's still an issue of, of relationship that needs to be talked to, but it's been forgiven. And Christians hold on to this, and they don't understand how much Christ has set us free. You realize that God, if you've repented of that sin and you trusted in Jesus, God will bring up that sin no more. That's the whole idea of he remembers a sin no more. He'll never bring it up again. He'll never bring it up again. But I see Christians all the time throwing it to one another. Right? Throwing it to one, you did this, and you did that, and you held on to this, and you did that. And it's like, wait a minute, forgiven? Yes, but I want to hold on to it, because I don't think he's suffered enough. I don't think she's suffered enough yet. And we have this whole weird complex that we can't really trust Christ for the freedom that he's been given us. Not just the freedom from law. We can all agree with it. How about the freedom from self? And freedom from the past, and freedom from the hurts and pains and things that you dealt with in the past, and you hold on to it. Anyway, I don't know how I got into that, but maybe the Lord needed to say that, so praise the Lord. <laughs> Trying to keep the commandments, all of them, all of them. And those two things don't mix, Paul says. I testify to you, again, to every man who receives circumcision, that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Again, Paul reiterates it again. It was found in chapter 3. It's found in chapter 4. Now, found in chapter 5. Why is Paul repeating himself? He needs more room to write. No, it's because we forget. We forget and we have to be reminded of. We, if you go back under the law and requirements and things of that nature, then all your efforts, you don't need God. You really don't need God. You don't really need the grace of God. You really just need to have your own efforts to do it. And you're basically dealing with God in a contract. God says this. You say, I'll do it. And then you say, okay, God, pay me back for what I did. It's kind of a reward system. You know, God says, this is his law. Then you do it. And then you say, God, you know, pay me a little bit here. You know, give me some, give me some, uh, give me some payback here. Then if you're going to go under that, God can reward you. But God can also judge you if you mess up on the law. Right? So you get in the system of contracts. I want my reward, but are you willing to also receive the judgment and punishment for not keeping the law because that comes with it too everybody says oh man it's so great when i keep the law I'm gonna keep sabbath I'm gonna keep kosher I'm gonna keep all these things but nobody thinks what happens when you break the law the bible is very clear about the punishment for breaking the law and so take on the whole law you take on the whole law rewards and punishments sounds like a book right but it is true rewards and punishment that's what the law requires anybody here want to take on the law no, thanks. Thank you, Jesus, for his grace and mercy. But let's appropriate it, right? Because it's one thing to know it. It's one thing to live it. And Paul's going to make that very clear. Christ will be, be no benefit to you if you try to keep the law. You can't have law and grace. You can't have the Holy Spirit in the law of Moses. 
They're mutually exclusive. They're mutually exclusive. So how can you keep the law? How can you keep the law? How can you keep it practically anyway? Without a temple, even a temple today. There's no temple today in Jerusalem. Most of the, most of the laws of Moses are related to the temple and the temple sacrifice system and things you do in the temple. So people try to keep the Sabbath, try to keep kosher laws. In fact, by doing that, like I said earlier, they are a lawbreaker because they don't do the whole law. I haven't met anybody that can meet the whole law. Only one person could and did. Jesus, the Messiah. If you go under the law, Paul says, the Bible says, Jesus says, you are a lawbreaker because you can't keep it. It is meant to show you your inability to keep it. It is meant to show you that you have sinned before God. It is meant to show you that you cannot meet the standard of God and therefore points you to the one who could and did for you and offers you salvation and offers you salvation. So when, uh, when people begin to see this, and they go, I want to do it by my own efforts. They're traveling up the wrong road. They're going on the wrong way. Grace is undeserved, unmerited, right? There's no one that could do it except for God can keep the law. So we are to, when you come to Christ, this is very, very important. And listen to this. When you come to Christ, it's not just the sins that we have been forgiven of, that we repented of. But it's also the good deeds that we have tried to do in order to have favor with God. You're to repent of both. Most people just want to repent of their bad deeds, of their, of their sins. You know, I did this, I did that. Yes, you did. Repent of it. Believe, yes. But what about the ones that you have tried to be a good person? You really tried to show God that, hey, you're going to get a good thing. When you, when you got me, you're going to get a really good thing. I'm going to keep every part of the law. And Paul says, you can't. And Paul says, I try to do it. He studied Philippians. In chapter 3, Paul repented of his good deeds. Paul gave you the list of good deeds that, by the way, nobody else here has that pedigree. And he says, those things which I accumulated for myself, things that I did and things who I was, you know, as, as, as a Jew, they are absolutely skubula. I don't speak Greek, Pastor. That's right, skubula. We've studied it here. You know what that means. It means it's translated dung. But you know, the Bible was translated for very nice people like us, <laughs> very nice people like you, that, you know, proper English and polite English. It is actually a very crude and difficult word to translate into English without actually offending somebody. Scubula, dung, fecal matter, um, defecation comes to mind, right? That's what he said. That's what the, see, the Bible is very, very, for the common man. It's for the common people. You go out to the street, witness to somebody, use what the Bible actually says. Polite language, dung. Most people wouldn't even know what that is. But if you tell them what it is, they'll get it. Isn't that a wonderful picture, isn't it? A little boy goes to the bathroom. He comes running to his dad. Dad, Lord, dad, look what I've done. And he goes and he shows you what he did in the toilet. And he says, look, look, this is good, right? It's the little boy it's telling his dad he did good, and he said, yes, that's good, and flush it, right? I did that. Um, that, it's an equivalent to us going to God and saying, God, look what I've done. Look what I've done, the good that I've done. Look, it's, it must mean something. It must mean something. And try to earn God's favor through that. It's like a little boy pretending that his scubula is actually a good thing that he's done. It's the same thing. And Isaiah talks about the, what happens to, from the women's perspective, right? The menstrual rags. Anyway, verse 4. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. If you go back under the law, if you go back under the law, Christ will be no value to you. That's what he says in verse 3. Uh, sorry, verse 2. Benef no benefit to you. You have actually have fallen from grace. You have actually been severed from Christ. It's a very strong language, isn't it? I wish Paul was a little nicer about it, but he's trying to make the point. And this is where some commentaries differ than others. And maybe you and I will differ from this. And maybe, you know, and I love you and you love me and we can, we can love on, on each other with the scriptures and the word of God. 
Um, but I think that Paul is saying something very clear. I don't even have to explain it to you. Now, when you say to me, but, and you go on to explain some philosophical ideas, then I'm going to be like, let's stick to what the Bible says. And just read what it says. You have been severed from Christ. Who has been severed from Christ if they go under the law? The Galatians. Paul said, brethren. Paul said, brethren, to these people. People in Galatia. Brethren, I love you. You are my sons. I'm like a mother to you. He used that uh, analogy last week. I am your father in the faith. I'm like a mother who's trying to take care of you. I'm like a pastor who's trying to keep you from false things. And he says, I don't know what to do with you. Chapter 4, yesterday, last week. I don't know what to do with you anymore. You keep following these men, these Judaizers, and you keep going away from Christ and away from Christ, and you kind of see where Paul is leading to this, right? First, he's talking about Christ will be no benefit to you. Uh, you're taking the law, the grace of God as a vain thing in chapter 2. Now he says, if you keep going on this road, you'll be severed from Christ. Now, the word sever simply means cut off. It is the same idea that you have in the Old Testament. When people, when the Jewish people broke the law of Moses and continually in rebellion against the law of Moses, it said that they were cut off from the people of God. They were no longer, they were Jews, but they had no partaking in the fellowship of the commonwealth of Israel. They were actually moved out. It's called cut off. You were cut off from the people. It was a terrible thing to happen. Nobody wanted that to happen. But yet it did happen as a punishment for those rebels who would not adhere to the law of Moses. Now here we're talking about not the law of Moses. We're talking about something even greater than the law of Moses. And that's what the writer of Hebrews says. If breaking the law of Moses had a severe punishment, how much would it be for those who have trampled on the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? If breaking the law of Moses was severe, there's no doubt about it. How much more would it be for those who trample on the blood of Jesus, trample on the salvation of Jesus? You'll be severed from Christ. You'll be cut off from Christ. If you seek to be justified by the law, now the word justify simply means to be acquitted. Okay, to be acquitted. You've been in a courtroom scenario? Don't ask, don't tell, right? But if you've ever been in a scenario like that, you're, you're pleading and you're praying that the judge will say, not guilty. <laughs> That's what you want. Acquit it. You might have done it. You probably did do it. But under the circumstances, the judge can say, not guilty. And you walk out of that room on the verge of going to prison forever or for a, for a long time, and you walk out a free man, justified, acquitted. God does not justify your sins. It's one thing we have to remember. He does not justify the sins. My sins are unjustifiable. In fact, they're so unjustifiable, the Messiah had to, hung, had to hang on the cross and bleed for me so that I would be justified. Who does God justify? Not sin, but who? The person. The person is justified. Now, the person is guilty. Absolutely, without a doubt. Why? The law of Moses said you are. The law of Moses said you are guilty. Look at it. Stand next to those ten and tell me, have you ever done one of them? You've done two of them. You've done three? Well, let's do it this way. Has anyone kept all ten? Nine? Eight? Seven? Six? Five? Four? Three? Two? One. It's like a countdown, right? All have sinned. All are guilty. All have fallen short of the glory of God. That's only ten. There's 603 others that you have to abide by, right? We know the 10 because that's the one that we mostly think about and use. It's a summation of all the laws. But if you broke one, the Bible says you broke them all. Even if you stood here and said, I've never done that. I never committed adultery. You know what I can tell you what? I've never committed adultery. I've never done it by the grace of God. But Jesus said, here's a different standard. You've been told, thou shalt not commit adultery. Whew, thank God I made that one. But Jesus said, if you look with lust but a woman or man and you desire for them to be your husband and imagine them to be in a, in, a, in a husband and wife relationship sexually, if you imagine that with anyone, 
It says you're guilty, just like the person who physically did it. Oh, boy. Jesus said, if you, you heard it said that if you murder somebody, that's wrong. Yes, it's true. It's wrong. But I tell you, I never murdered anybody. Praise the Lord for that. I never murdered anybody. Never got up a gun and did something like that. However, thank you. However, this room is full of murderers. And I'm probably the biggest one. Why? Because Jesus said, well, you know, you, you like to keep the letter of the law. But what about the intention of the law? The intention of the law was to say, don't hate. And if you hated somebody, you're just as guilty as the guy who pulled the trigger. Oh, boy. That's two. <laughs> Under the new understanding that Jesus gives from his Sermon on the Mount, I am already a murderer. I'm already an adulterer. And if I ever use God's name in vain, I'm a blasphemer already. And if I ever desired something that somebody owns for myself, I'm a thief, even though I never took it, but I took it in my heart, I'm already, who can, who can deliver me from this? This is what the law brings you to, a desperation. And you say, oh, that's only four. There's 609 others. If I'm guilty of one already, I broke the law. It's like trying to hang from a, you know, hang a, you know if you hang on a cliff, with the chain, and the links of the chains are the commandments of God, and you broke one of them, that's all it takes, my brother. You're that's going right. down. That's all it takes is to break one link, because it's a whole thing, let alone talk about the first commandment. Thou shalt worship the Lord your God and have no other gods before you. That was it. I was gone, because I was the biggest God for myself. I was the biggest God. I, I, had, I had a God before God. That was me. The law, you try to be justified by that. I just proved it in five little points, right? If you try to justify by the law, good luck, right? If you're trying to be justified by it, try it. Just stand next to it and see what happens. <laughs> you know, Paul the Apostle, very righteous under the law. He says if he, people looked at Paul, he said he would be found blameless, meaning that if you just looked at him on the outside, you would say, man, Paul keeps everything. He's a very good dude. But Paul says in Romans, when I looked at the law, and there was one commandment that just obliterated Paul. Anybody know what that was? Covetousness. He looked at the ninth commandment, and he says, oh, covetousness, desiring other people's stuff, other people's things, other people's, maybe even other people's wives, desiring covetousness. He said, I found all manner of covetousness in me. And I said, that's it. I stood guilty before the law. If you're trying to be justified by that, Paul couldn't. Paul couldn't even do it. Then you have fallen from grace. The justification that God gives is through faith and repentance. But if you come to God and you believe that Jesus has died for your sins, rose from the dead to forgive you, and you turn, you're willing to turn from that sin, God says, justified, as if you've never did any of those gazillion sins that you were involved in. And that is the justification of Christ. The justification of the law is, come on, let's, let's stand next to the ten and see what happens, right? And none of us are justified. But if you want to be justified by it, you will have fallen from grace. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, because the writer of Hebrews, now some will say it would be Paul, I don't know. There's good evidence he might have been. But without being dogmatic about it, I don't know. But the writer of Hebrews says very similar things. He says in Hebrews chapter 4, Therefore, previous three chapters, Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any, and any, uh, any, of, any one of you should seem to have uh, come short of it, for indeed... We have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith with those who heard it. There are a warning to believers in the book of Hebrews about not falling or not coming short of the grace of God. The grace and the rest that is promised to them 
And it says there is a good example. Look at the Jews in the Old Testament. The Jews in the Old Testament, which is the, the whole thing about chapter 3, chapter 3 says that they were into the wilderness and they began to complain against God and turn away from God. In fact, God says, you know what? You're not coming in anymore. God said to the Jewish people, you're not coming in. There's only two people of that generation that went out of Egypt, only two made it into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because they rebelled against God, they fell into unbelief, and the things that they was, it was a profit to them, things that would have been good for them to do, they actually, it says, they did not mix it with faith. They didn't have faith to trust God with it. And they fell and came short. And the book of Hebrews makes it very clear that let's not happen to you, those who have a hardened heart against God. Make sure it does not happen to you, a hardened heart against God. And it could happen. Otherwise, the warning means absolutely nothing. Why have a warning if it can't happen? So back to Galatians. Back to Galatians. Chapter 5 again. You have fallen from grace. It is possible for Christians to be severed from Christ and fall short of the grace of God. Because that's what that verse says. I don't have to quote you from another book or from a theological reading of, of uh, you know, systematic theology of anything like that. I just read what the verse says. And the verse says exactly what it says. Verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, are, uh, for we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for hope, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Faith working through love. What is the basis of the Christian life? We're winding this up because we're only going to go to verse 12 today. What is the basis of the Christian life? Paul is going to give us... A few things to discover. The basis of the Christian life is not church attendance. The basis of the Christian life is not even how much you read the Bible. Those things are good. The basis of the Christian life is not even how much you pray every day. Well, those things are good to do. What is the basis of the Christian life, Paul says? And he's going to describe it in such a way. It's a relationship with three people. It's a relationship with three people. It's a relationship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's going to describe it here. Through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, he says, there is neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love, the relationship with God. You are not a Christian because you believe in God. Are they all right with that? You're not a Christian because you believe in God. People say, I believe in God. At least he believes in God. It doesn't mean he's a Christian. It means he believes in God, at least acknowledges it. Uh, the Bible says even, even Satan will do that. Even Satan can acknowledge that there is one God. What makes a Christian a Christian is you believe in the Son of God. You believe in Jesus. You believe that he did what he did on that cross for you. And, and you're helped to do that by his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul mentions the Holy Spirit. You have a stable foundation if you can relate to God through his Son and by his Spirit. That's why he gave us his Spirit. And later on in chapter 5, we're not going to get to tonight, today, might be tonight, uh, we're not going to relate to that because Paul's going to talk about it next week. What does it mean now as a Christian to live by the Spirit? Because if you don't have the Spirit... By definition, you're not a Christian. But if you are a Christian, then these are the things that happen to Christians that walk in the Spirit. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's the fruit of the flesh. There's the works of the flesh. And so this is the basis of the Christian life. Paul mentions another set of three. Not only the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but look what it says here. Faith, verse 5, for the hope of righteousness, for in Christ Jesus... There's neither circumcision or uncircumcision, but faith working through love. Paul loves to talk about it in threes. There's a Father, there's a Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to talk about faith, hope, and love. And I hope you understand this as, as Christians. He uses this word 
hope, elpis in Greek. I wish we could translate the word hope in a different, in a different word now in, in our English language because as an American, hope doesn't mean what the Bible means hope, right? Uh, hope means an Americanism means I'm not sure if it's going to happen, but I'm hoping that it does. That's what hope means today. That's the vernacular of hope. Are you going to go to work tomorrow? I hope not. <laughs> you get the point? Okay, I hope not. See, it doesn't mean what the Bible means, you know. Are you going to, um, are you going to uh, not eat tomorrow? I hope not. Are you going to, I don't know, what else? What else are you going to do that you're hoping not? You know? <laughs> are you going to have to go to the post office tomorrow? I hope not, you know. It's, it's a something that it's unsure, right? It's, it means an unsure thing, you know. Are you going to be there? I hope so. They say that, I go, I don't know, that might not happen, right? Because that's how we use the word. That's vernacular. We use hope as, eh, I'm hoping, but maybe, right? The Bible doesn't mean that. And sometimes we read into, with our Americanism, we read it into the Bible. I wish the Bible would say secure, um, what would be a good one? Secure, because the word elpis means a security, uh, a foundational truth that is non-negotiable. It would mean a lot of words. <laughs> maybe, maybe you guys are wordsmith can condense it into one. But this assurance of security, of hope, it's what the, 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 the Bible speaks about. It's the hope of, what does it say? Of righteousness. What is the hope of righteousness? We're waiting on the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Well, those who wait on the Lord and the promises of God are going to get something amazing. Righteousness. Righteousness is two things. Righteousness is one, God treats you like you are a right standing person with him. Right? Righteousness. Amen. Praise the Lord. Righteousness. God treats you as a right standing person with him, meaning that no flaws. Before him, you are righteous. Well, how can God do that? Because he justifies you. But he doesn't just justify you and say, okay, now go on. Have a good time. I justified you. Because another process takes place after that. And that is the other meaning of righteousness is that God is forming you and making you into righteousness. It's called sanctification, right? The justification. God declares you righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. Waiting for that righteousness means as you live out your faith, God is molding you, shaping you, and sanctifying you, setting you apart so that righteousness will come out of your life and you literally will become more righteous. And one day you will stand face to face with the author of that righteousness and you will be perfectly righteous. You'll be perfectly righteous. Until then, you are being sanctified. The hope that Paul is talking about here is the glorification, the other part of salvation, glorification. So justification happens in an instant. He declares you acquitted, free. Sanctification takes on a whole life, a whole journey of your Christian walk, a whole process of God making you more like his son, sanctification. And then in a moment, glorification. See, I like the justification and glorification. And most Christians just stop at the justification. And they're not told that you have to go on believing, that you have to go on faith with Jesus. It's actually the biggest part of your Christian walk. It's the sanctification process. But there is so little of that being done because we just think, first step, that's it. And I'm waiting for the rapture. And people sit idle. What are you doing? I'm justified. I'm waiting for the glorified part. Well, you're missing the whole sanctified part. It's a whole life that you have to walk with Jesus, and you have to go on believing in him. But it says this, love, a love, that faith working through love, through uh, a true faith develops love. This is, the, this, is, this is why it's like fundamental Christianity. I, I don't mean to like revert, you know, regurgitate this in, in a sense of like, okay, I'm just going to, tell you what it is since you guys all know it, but this is foundational for Christians to understand. And sometimes we don't get the foundational part. Faith, hope. 
If you have real faith, you'll have this hope of righteousness that's coming. If you have real faith, they'll develop in love. What is that love? A love, it works through love. That was what Christian produces. If, a, if you have real faith, it'll produce love. If you have real faith, it'll be a loving aspect toward your relationship with God. First of all, he loves us, and therefore we can love him. But once you get to know him, you get to love him. And you go on loving Jesus, and not just loving Jesus, but loving his people. See, there's a faith that's actually very intellectual. Right? I can give you the intellectual faith. I can hand you a book and you say, check all, the, check all the boxes. You're good to go. You get all the doctrines, good. But now you need to live it out. And this is what the faith working through love means. You need to work it out. And by the way, you can't work it out by yourself. <laughs> Pastor, are you saying church attendance? What I'm saying is fellowship with other believers. You will never work love. Faith will never be working through love if you're by yourself. Be a lot of self-love. <laughs> a lot of self-love. When well, how is love worked out? With others. And by the way, not just the ones that love you back. That's easy. Even the Pharisees did that. That's what Jesus said. Even the Pharisees did that. How about the ones that don't love you? Oh, Pastor. That's too hard. Well, if you have faith, it'll be working, that faith will be working through love to other believers, to other people that you don't get along with, right? If it's not springing from faith in Jesus, right? If it's not building in confidence and hope and expression of love, then it's not real faith. It has to be worked out that way. Now, as we finish, let's look at verse 7. You are running well. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who hindered you? Running well. Christianity, it's, it's described in the Bible never as a standstill intellectual uh, you know, exercise. The Bible describes Christianity as a walk and as a race. And the Jews were not keen on athletics, but Paul was. Uh, one of the reasons they didn't keen on athletics is because most of the athleticism of the day was done by the Greeks. Love the body, they love the workouts and performance and sports, and it was done in the nude. So therefore, Jews were, did not want to be a part of that. So that's why they're not involved in many athleticisms at the time. But Paul was talking to Gentiles, Galatians, so talking to Gentiles who knew what this was about, and he tells them, it's a race. You ran well, you did the first step. You were justified. You were beginning to the sanctify part. But somebody hindered you from obedience. Somebody hindered you from, who prevented you from this? That's what he's saying. Who stopped you? Um, by the way, the obedience to the truth. Did you read that part? Obedience to the truth. Putting into practice. Christians are very good at listening to sermons. They're good at listening to sermons. At least some, some of them. But they failed on the part that it's the most critical. Take what you learn and apply it. Oh, man. Put it into practice. Otherwise, it's just sitting in church. That's exactly what you're doing today. If all you did today was like, uh-huh, 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 okay, clock, okay, done, good, let's go home. If that's all you did and you call that Christianity, we have a totally definition of Christianity according to the Scriptures. Christianity, Paul says, hey, who hindered you from sitting at a, at a church service? Who hindered you from listening to a sermon? No, that's not, what, that's not what it says. I have glasses on. Hindered you from obeying the truth. Obeying the truth. See how different it is? The obedience. When you hear God's word today, it should develop in you maybe something uncomfortable, Maybe something challenging, maybe something you don't like this guy, or offensive, or whatever it is. And it should draw you to move in the direction that, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply that. And if you come 50 times, 52 times a year, there are 52 different thoughts. If you just get one thought today, just one, so out of all that I said, you take one thing, and you said, I'm going to do that tonight. Then if you come back next Sunday, and you come back the Sundays after that, and you come back 52 times that, that year, 52 steps closer to Jesus, 
52 steps in your walk, if you apply that, just one. You can apply many more, but just one. The obedience to the truth. Verse 8, the persuasion did not come from God who called you. Look, you didn't get this from God. The hindrance, that hindrance, uh, the idea to go back under the law, that didn't come from God. Didn't come from him. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Paul is quoting Jesus. He's quoting also in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What is the, the, the little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? It's the little things. It's the little things. It's a little leaven. It's not much. Now, the leaven in the Bible could be malice, could be pride, could be hypocrisy. It could be false teachings. You don't need a whole lot of those to infect a lot of people. That's what Paul is saying. You don't need a whole lot of it. If you ever made sourdough, you know what I mean. The little leaven, the little decay, a little decay, a little thought, a little teaching, a little false thing, a little attitude, a little thing that begins to propagate through the community or through the fellowship. It becomes a leaven. It becomes almost something that you can't stop after a while. Why? Because it gets to everyone. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. A little division, a little faction, somebody wanting to keep the Sabbath here. Somebody says, no, you have to do this to be a Christian. You have to do that to be a Christian. Instead of faith and trust in Jesus, then all of a sudden you've got a little group over there that's in the back. They're the ones who are keeping the law of Moses. And this group doesn't want to deal with them. And this group doesn't want to talk to them. And this group thinks they're crazy. And then they're going back and forth. And everybody, how did that happen? All of a sudden you have four different churches in one setting. A little leaven. Leavens a whole lump of dough. It could be malice. It could be pride. But look at verse 10. I have confidence in you, says Paul, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Paul is saying, I have confidence in the Lord that he's going to keep the true gospel being preached. In fact, I believe, this in, I believe 100% what Paul is saying, true. No matter what the church goes through, false teaching gospels, bad twisted gospels are out there, God will always have his true gospel being preached, his true gospel being shining through, his people still preaching the gospel. And it will happen until the day that Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives. No doubt about it. Paul is going to have confidence that this is going to have, Jesus is going to come and the gospel is still going to be preached, that you will adopt no other view. Paul's very confident in this, that his view is correct. Paul's view, or what he's teaching, is correct. And unfortunately, you know, not much in this church, but unfortunately, there are churches that see Paul as an enemy, that they don't read the letters of Paul, whether red-letter Christians, what they call it, or other groups or other sects that don't read the, the epistles of Paul. Paul is an enemy to them. And what Paul is saying is very serious. He's saying, look... If I'm correct, then you are not to go back under the law of Moses. I have confidence, Paul says. The gospel will still shine. Verse 11. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. I got two minutes, and I'll do it very, very quickly. There was a rumor that Paul was preaching circumcision. This rumor was started probably by some of the Judaizers. And it probably started because, yes, there was a man that Paul uh, asked to be circumcised. And that was Timothy. He was a Jewish man, uh, which also was half Greek, half Gentile. And in order to reach the Jews in Jerusalem, Paul had asked Timothy to be circumcised. What was the reason? Does Timothy could become a better Christian? No, so that he can reach those who are the circumcision, the Jews. Paul preached this in a very different way in Corinthians. Be all things to all men. To those under the law, I became as under the law. To those without the law, I became as without the law, but not apart from the law of Christ, not with sin. What Paul is saying very, very clearly is that there, in order to reach some people, you may have to look like them to reach them. Now, I know that this is why I don't believe in dress codes in churches, personally, because of what Paul says. There are people that you can reach that I can't reach because of my background, maybe because of the way I dress, maybe because of who I am, maybe because whatever, culturally, background, race, whatever. There are some people you can reach 
And if you want to reach them, brother, sister, dress like them. Go talk to them. Be like them, but without sin. But without sin. That's what Paul is saying. Timothy, go to the Jews. Preach to them. He had to get circumcised in order to do that. By the way, circumcision, when we talk about circumcision, he's talking about some, it's basically the, the, the idea of the whole law. So let's, I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, when he talks about circumcision or going back under circumcision, he's not saying only the men get to do this. Right? He's referring to the aspect of the law that it's embodied in the idea of circumcision. When you go under circumcision and you use it as a way to get closer to God, you are buying into the whole law of Moses. And that's what Paul's referring to the circumcision. He goes, it's one of the biggest parts of the laws of Moses. What's the circumcision part? They made it a, a credo sort of thing. You know, there was kosher law, Sabbath keeping, and circumcision was the biggest key. Paul did this to Timothy, and so they said, oh, Paul's using circumcision. And Paul's saying, then why am I being persecuted? Why am I being persecuted if I'm preaching circumcision? If I was a false teacher like them, they wouldn't be persecuting me because the devil doesn't persecute false teachers. The devil doesn't persecute false gospels. The devil doesn't care that those people are teaching falsely and, and, and uh, uh, leading people astray. He loves it. Who are the ones that we persecuted? The one that treats to teach the true gospel. Paul's saying, all the things that happened to me, shipwrecked, left for dead, stoned, 40 lashes or 40 stripes minus one, sh uh, shipwrecked, stoned, uh, in perils of, of danger, in perils with men, in perils with the beast, in perils in the seas, in perils in the land, in perils with the Gentiles, in perils with the Jews, in perils with false brethren, he says. I said, if I was teaching circumcision, I would never, none of these things would have happened to me, 2 Corinthians 11. But because I preach the cross, Paul says, because I preach the cross, that's why I get persecuted. The cross of Jesus is a stumbling block, he says. It's a stumbling block. Why is the cross, this is the final point, why is the cross a stumbling block for people? For one, it's foolishness. How can you be made right by a man that died 2,000 years ago and believe that that's going, to get, that's going to get you to heaven? The world hears that and says, huh, well, that's weird. You believe some man out there died 2,000 years ago and that's because of him you're going to go to heaven even though you're really bad? Yep. Ah, that's foolishness. How crazy. You have to be crazy to believe that. By the way, that's what I used to say. That's what I used to say. Talk about God having the final laugh, right? How can that be? A bloody cross that you're going to be saved by? Then you hear the gospel more clearly. You go, oh, that's why he did it. But to the, to the, to the natural man, it's foolishness. Uh, put it this way. Jesus dies on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin, but that's not all that happens on the cross. He invites us to come to the cross and go through the cross, to it and through it, to the cross, salvation, through the cross, sanctification. Pick up your cross, follow him. And my flesh does not like the cross. My old nature fights against that cross. My flesh doesn't want the cross. i rather live on my own set of values and set of things that I like to do. And I don't want the cross to get in the way of that. That was not only true before I became a Christian. That's true. But now as a Christian, God giving me a new nature. My old nature says, don't go there. Just relax today. Just don't worry about it. Just live your own life, man. You've been set free. I've been set free to follow Jesus. That's what I've been set free for. And the cross is an enemy of my pride, an enemy of my flesh. And that's why the cross is so dangerous for people that want to be religious. If you met somebody that wants to be religious, they never talk about the cross. They never talk about the blood of Jesus. What do they talk about? Yeah, I did this and I kept that. And I did. But those who have come through the blood of Jesus, those who have come through the cross, they don't talk about the good that they've done. What do they talk about? This is what Jesus did for me. This is what Jesus has done for me. That's the difference. Paul says it's an offense. And he says the most offensive thing and I'm done. The most offensive thing, he says, I wish those people that were trying to put you back under the law of Moses, I wish they slipped their knives and cut themselves. Well, that's not, that's a, what's wrong with that? 
In Greek, I'll give you what it says in Greek. I wish that those who were trying to put you back under the law get their knives, and instead of circumcising you, they would not only circumcise themselves, I got the kids in the back, and they would emasculate themselves, I'd slip into the knife, and you become a eunuch. Yikes. What happened to Paul? What happened to tolerance? Paul says, you know what? This is so important. I wish those people that were trying to destroy your faith will destroy their genitals. Man, that's what the Bible's so earthy, isn't it? It's real. It's not like, well, you know, it's kind of nice to, you know, mutilate yourself. It's like, <laughs> he's saying the thing that you're thinking about is what he's saying. First of all, why did Paul say that? Very much in the culture of the day. Oh, I got the kids coming. I got to do it real quick. The, in the temple, in the temple of Galatia, they worshiped this, uh, this god, Sibeli. And Sibeli had prostitutes, male and female. Male and female prostitutes. You know what they did to the males? That's right. They became eunuchs, so there wouldn't be any pregnancies. There wouldn't be any propagation of, of those male prostitutes. So female and male prostitutes, the male ones got the knife, they cut themselves, became eunuchs, so there wouldn't be any propagation of other male prostitutes. There wouldn't be any offsprings from that. Paul is saying exactly that. I wish they would cut themselves, the Judaizers, so they wouldn't have any offsprings from their false gospel. I wish they would cut themselves to the point where there will be no Judaizers coming from them. I wish, I wish that those who were trying to destroy you would actually destroy themselves. I'll have Mark come up and, and lead us into, lead us into uh, communion. The cross, my friend, how do we sum it up? Go back to slavery or hang on to the freedom the cross, the cross has given you. Jesus and the cross provide you the freedom. Freedom from yourself. Freedom from the law. Freedom from sin. It's just a little minor operation, as the Judaizers would say. It's just a little thing. It's just a little circumcision. The little foxes spoil the vine. If you compromise in one area, you will go down the road of compromise after compromise after compromise. Hang on to your freedom. Hang on to Jesus Christ. Hang on to the cross. Don't just come to the cross, but go through it. Pick it up. Follow him. And if you drop it, pick it up again. A righteous man falls seven times. The Lord picks him up. Pick up your cross. Follow him. That's freedom. You want true freedom? Follow Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you tonight. We praise you for your kindness and mercy. We praise you for the cross, Lord. We praise you that through the cross, we have forgiveness of sin, but also, Lord, not only forgiveness of sin, but forgiveness from self, uh, uh, freedom from self. Freedom to follow you and not to be in bondage with the things of the world, the things of the law, and the things that my old nature wants to do. Lord, my, the freedom that you've given us. Help us to keep it, Lord, by faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Mark, why don't you come up?